Hey guys, Dr. Lowry coming at you with another video, one that uh, is pretty new and, and something that I just want to get open and, and out there and talk about because uh, it's something that came up. I was at KetoCon uh, this weekend. I was there talking with uh, so many amazing people, so many great friends, uh, just hanging out really. And something came up completely like uh, not relevant necessarily to keto, but it was funny because I remember sitting there with my good friend Keto Savage, uh, for those of you who, who know him by his Instagram name. We were sitting there and I told him about this video that I had just seen on Instagram. And the minute I told him that, like, his jaw, like, almost hit the table. Like, he was like, you got to be kidding me. And the video that I saw that was crazy is Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of the icons of bodybuilding, muscle, uh, just an overall icon in the world, is coming out with a documentary of, that's vegan-based. I ate a lot of meat. They showed us commercials. A steak, that's what a man eats. Selling that idea that real men eat meat. But you got to understand, that's marketing. Um, and basically talking, it's called Game Changers. And he's talking about uh, like how it was, like he always thought real men needed to eat meat and how he always thought like, I need to have meat, I need to have meat. And what I assume, and again, the only thing I've seen is the one trailer and the one thing that was on Instagram. And the only thing I, I assume that this uh, is, is meant to talk about, I guess he's switching more to a vegetarian, plant-based diet. And it's interesting, right? And I think the, the route that he's taking with it is featuring, at least in the, in the little part that I saw, a lot of athletes, high-level high individuals, who are operating and, and working out and saying like, listen, like for a while we thought like in order to build muscle and, and have performance, we need to eat a lot of meat and have muscle. It's fascinating because he clearly did that throughout his entire bodybuilding career and now he's on the latter side of that. And I love Arnold because he's an icon. He's done so much for the sport, fitness, health world in general, literally someone that I looked up to. And so that's why like, uh, when we heard this, I was talking with Danny Vega about it too. Like literally I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like the, like the guy who is the epitome of, of muscle is now talking, maybe I don't even want to use the word against because I'm not making, uh, judgments on it, but talking about how meat might not be as important as he once thought. And so I don't want to cast judgment um, because I've, I, I'll make this very clear because I know there's going to be a bunch of vegans and vegetarians that jump on this because a lot of them did when I did the carnivore video and they didn't like it. But here's the thing. I have no problem whatsoever if your choice is vegan or vegetarian um, for whatever reason you may, you may choose that for. I have a good friend, Dr. Will Cole. I actually had him on the podcast. And he has a book called Ketotarian where he talks all about a plant-based approach towards keto. And he actually incorporates in fish uh, to his diet. So I'm fine with it. I have nothing against it, no stigma. However, people taking that approach and talking down and saying that things that just aren't factual uh, is the reason they're going vegan is a challenge for me and something that uh, ultimately the the role or goal of this is to educate people and go, hey, maybe let me change my perspective because if you look at some of the work that uh, Paul Saladino is doing, Sean Baker, like literally people who have been vegan for 10, 20, 30 years now consuming meat and radically, literally not only consuming meat, but going full carnivore and radically seeing uh, enormous changes in their health and body composition. So I'm not saying by any means that it's not possible to live a healthy life uh, under guidance on a vegan or vegetarian diet. Uh, you do need some things, which I'm going to talk about, in order to make it uh, fully complete. But I think, uh, like Dr. Ken Berry talks about, the optimal human diet consists of meat uh, and consuming some meat in some form or fashion. Uh, whether you, you go back however many years you want to go back and look at it, we've always consumed meat. And so I think it's an interesting concept, talk, idea that's come about. And I know I'm going to get a ton of slack for people who are vegan or vegetarian. And, and I, 
I hope this serves as more of an education outlet than me tr trying to seem like I'm talking down to vegan or vegetarians because it's not what this is intended to do. Uh, but more trying to understand the principles around it and really addressing some of the root issues of what most people think about and why they tend to switch to plant-based diets. And I think that's the most important piece because trust me, there's no one in the world who wants a more humane, ethical, and environmentally friendly nutrition option than me. Like I'm, I'm huge on all of those things. I just think we need to keep things in context, right? Like I have a dog, right? He's sitting here. Um, I love animals. It's not, it's not like I'm like, oh, uh, like hugely against animals. I love them, but uh, there's some things that I'll talk about in my second point on this regarding animals and my whole concept around why I do eat meat despite loving my dog. Uh, first and foremost, in this documentary, I'm sure they're going to be highlighting athletes, and this is one of the scariest part about the entire thing, is that athletes, more than anyone, need muscle and good quality nutrients in order to fuel their performance. One of the things about plant-based diets is they are very low in essential amino acids, extremely low. If you look at plant-based protein sources versus animal-based uh, protein sources, completely different amino acid profile and one that doesn't necessarily favor muscle anabolism or muscle building. So these individuals likely either need to eat more protein, um, which we have a study on, or supplement with things like additional leucine or essential amino acids, even to just hit that threshold and trigger muscle growth and prevent muscle catabolism. And I think that doesn't happen very frequently, and I think that's something that doesn't get talked about a lot, is if you are choosing a vegan or vegetarian or plant-based approach, you need to be cognizant of the amount of protein, and more so than protein, the uh, muscle building or uh, in, uh, recovery amino acids that are actually meant to do something. Things like leucine, which is a very important amino acid, which is often low in plant-based proteins. Uh, for instance, we did a study at our lab several years ago that gets a lot of attention, where we looked at rice versus whey protein. We saw no differences when you supplemented at like 40 grams of protein. So yes, as long as you're eating ample amounts of plant-based proteins, you will be able to get enough of that substrate to trigger muscle growth. Now, if that study was done looking at 15 or 20 grams, you likely would see a difference. And all of the data and uh, information on muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown indicate that you need that. You need to hit have a higher amount due to the inefficient amount of essential amino acids that's typically found in plant-based proteins. So that's first and foremost. Uh, you need to, especially uh, if you're a female on a plant-based approach, need to supplement with a bioavailable form of iron um, because you're not getting it from the main source that you get iron from, which is meat. So that's essential. And creatine. Like creatine is a staple. I've talked about this before on different lives or videos that I've done. You're not getting that with out consuming meat. And these athletes are trying to perform and, and optimize uh, what they're doing at a high level. You can't do that without properly supplementing. And so I won't say a name, but uh, there was a good friend of mine who was a head dietitian at a very prominent school, and she was working with one of the top tennis athletes in the world who was dominating the sport four or five years ago. You guys may know who I'm talking about. And literally working with her on her nutrition and the amount of supplements and how dialed she needed to be into her diet and making sure she was eating a variety of different things to make sure she was getting enough essential amino acids, etc., was insane. And so it's possible, but like she needed one of the best dietitians in the world to literally monitor her and make sure she was getting in this supplement, this supplement, this supplement, these fatty acids from supplements, and like literally going through every single thing she needed in order to perform at a high level. And she's often clouded because she was a vegan or vegetarian uh, based athlete who was dominating her sport. But what people don't see is like it wasn't the common vegan or vegetarian approach that like you see today. Like it was very well constructed and supplemented on top of that to make sure she was getting those amino acids. So that's first and foremost. One of the things I'm nervous about with this documentary is how they're going to discuss 
that factor because Arnold is clearly the epitome of someone who has or who has had and still has uh, muscle mass. So I'm curious how they're going to break that concept uh, down on essential amino acids. Um, the second thing, and this one's probably uh, something that's more relevant and something that I think a lot of people, including myself, uh, of why they've looked into a plant-based approach before, because I have uh, in the past, uh, and after doing a lot of research, there's many reasons why I haven't done it, and I still enjoy some plants, but uh, my, my diet's primarily meat-based. Killing animals, right, or animal um, sacrificing animals is, is the way I like to put it. So sacrificing animals, and that's a big one, right? Like, oh, you, and a lot of people make the, like, the assumption, like, oh, eating beef, like, you wouldn't kill your dog. And I saw, like, someone doing a video the other day, and they, like, were talking to kids, and they were like, who would eat their dog? And the kids were like, no. Then they're like, why would you eat these chicken nuggets? Or why would you eat this beef? And I'm like, we're so far off on, on that comparison. But nonetheless, that's a comparison that gets made, is that all animals, uh, we should be uh, taking care of them, etc. So a couple things about this. I'm going to include some of these articles. Is that if you think that eating a meat-based diet is better for animals, meaning that you're not killing or, or sacrificing as many animals, then you have to do something. You have to say that you value one animal's life greater than another. There's no ifs, ands, or buts to that because if you are eating plants, you are killing a ton of animals. You're killing insects. You're, ki you're killing bunnies. You're killing mice. You're killing these things that get killed either due to the pesticides or the harvesting of the crops that you're consuming on a daily basis. So it's not a fact of the matter of, I love animals, um, I don't want to eat animals uh, because I don't want to kill them, and yet you're out eating quinoa or rice or wheat-based products, you're killing tons of animals. You just don't know it. And so you ha you're valuing that cow or that deer or that whatever you eat, that pig's life more because they look all cute and cuddly, right? But you're valuing it more than you value that insect, that mice, that rabbit that's running around the field that that tractor runs over while they're harvesting your crops. And that's the sad reality of it. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't wrap their minds around is they think like, oh, you're killing all these animals and you see the videos and trust me, I'm not for that at all. Like, uh, inhumanely treating animals, I'm not for that. I don't think that's beneficial for anyone. I don't think that's beneficial for the meat that you consume. But there are a lot of farmers now, especially due uh, to those concerns and a lot of people raising those, which was a good thing, is that they're humanely treating their animals. And I look at them as if they're sacrificial in the sense that they're, fee they're fueling you to go out and do something. You're alive because you consume something that ultimately sacrificed for your better well-being, right? And I actually had a very deep conversation with uh, Dr. Paul Saladino on this, and he brought a lot of perspective to it. The thing that like blows my mind is there are people who literally waste away their lives, and yeah, like those are the people that are eating Big Macs and eating crap, and they're wasting away. Like I look at that, and I am appreciative and grateful every single time I consume anything, let alone animal-based products because there was a sacrifice that was need that was made in order to fuel me. So I feel an obligation to go out and crush it and deal and and change lives in the world because there was a sacrifice made for me. Yet there are millions of people who go around and whether it's eating meat and or they're killing the mice, the bunnies, the squirrels, the insects, whatever's running through the the crops, they go around and they're they're eating crap all day long and they waste away their lives and they're not doing anything beneficial and they're still sacrificing animals but they're not putting it to a good use. And so it's interesting to wrap your mind around that concept and it's very difficult to do so uh, until you start looking at it from like a macro level looking down on it going, you know what, maybe, maybe I need to look at it from a different perspective and understand that, what if I call it sacrificing instead of killing? Because 
I, it's a sacrifice if I'm taking that fuel, taking that food, and going forward. Because at the end of the day, I say this all the time, tomorrow isn't promised. So I'm fueling myself today in order to better whatever I'm trying to accomplish today, hopefully tomorrow, hopefully the day after, and I'm appreciative and grateful for the opportunity to get that food. And so that's just a perspective change. And I'm going to mention this. I know this is going to get a lot of slack too. And I, I talked to Paul Saladino about this, but there's an Instagram page that I follow and uh, it's brutal. And don't get me wrong. Like ever, sometimes when I'm on there, like I see things and it makes my stomach queasy and I'm like, damn, but really like it's important for me to understand going into this. It's why I think like you see Ben Greenfield talk about it um, with his family, but like I think at some point any person that eats meat should have to go out and hunt an animal and understand the sacrificing process uh, and like what that means so that way you can really come to terms with it and be like like this is a this is sacrificing for the better good it's not just killing for the fun of it you know what I mean and I think there's a wet there's an Instagram page called nature is metal uh, and it's I, I've gotten tons of people to follow this and not because it's it is gruesome, but at the end of the day, it's it opens up your your mind and gives you perspective of the fact that like what happens in nature is a lot worse than what uh, me eating beef or steak is, or eating some type of meat to an animal who was humanely treated and then sacrificed for the greater well being of humans to consume. What goes on in nature is brutal, and this page highlights that. And like I said, it's not easy for me to to see that all the time. Like I do get queasy watching some of the live ones, but they're literally attacks of like a cheetah hunting down an animal and killing it, uh, or a snake eating something whole while it's live. Like those things happen in nature, and it's interesting because we're so disconnected from it that oftentimes we think, oh, that's not the case. Like there's this these cute, furry, friendly animals, but like what happens in nature is pretty brutal. And so it's interesting to, to think about that and wrap your mind around the fact that like, hey, this stuff happens. And uh, I that's why I look at it as a sacrifice to better human performance, human optimization, whatever you're doing it. So if you, have, if you are still interested or fascinated with that, I highly recommend that page uh, and check it out. And just be careful. I'm warning you ahead of time and I'll post it. But I'm warning you ahead of time, don't come back to me and be like, that was, it's brutal. But it does give you perspective and context of like, wow, like now I understand what goes into this. And I understand that nature is a lot more brutal than probably humans are when uh, eating meat or eating any type of poultry. The last thing I want to talk about, and this was something that was new to me, and this was always my big uncertainty. And it still is an uncertainty, so I would love to hear below in the comments if anyone has any greater detail or greater understanding of this, but the big one's carbon emissions. And I think that's where, because I know Arnold's big on this, um, but I think that's where a lot of this documentary might go is like, if you reduce the amount of beef that's consumed, you improve the carbon emissions. And that's true. The question is by how much? <coughs> so I pulled some, I did some research on this today and I pulled some stats and I want to go over these with you guys. So this is from, and I'll post all the links of where I got this stuff. This is from the University of Michigan fact sheet, uh, carbon footprint. So the question is how much, I'm going to post this graph right here, is uh, how much carbon emissions per, per serving of beef. And if you look at it, there's about 6.6 .6 pounds of carbon emitted per serving of meat. So let's use the example for all of these comparisons. Let's use the example of 12 pounds of carbon per day if you're eating two servings of meat, which would be four ounces. So imagine two four ounce steaks, which some people don't even eat that much, but just for, for the sake of this example and argument, let's use that. 12 pounds of CO2 per day with uh, eight ounces of meat daily. So imagine if your consumption was eight ounces of beef, not even just meat, beef. So we're gonna use that example of uh, 12 to 13 pounds of carbon eating eight ounces of meat. So I think it's important because that sounds like a lot and, and it, it can be, but I think it's important to keep things in context. So one gallon of gasoline 
releases 19.6 pounds of CO2 per gallon, 19.6 pounds. So right then alone, one gallon is more than two servings of meat daily, right? And so it was interesting. So I was like, let me look at this. So like, imagine, I'm pretty sure Ar Arnold, and I don't want to use Arnold, I'll use an actor, driving from Santa Monica, which is where a lot of people have houses, uh, to LA, right? Film studios, making movies, blah, blah, blah. Just say for the day, right? You drive up for the day, you drive home. It's about a 20 mile drive. And say you're driving a limo there, um, which is one, one of the, or, or a big SUV. At minimum, you're going through three to four gallons of gas driving there. And with LA traffic, depending upon what time you leave, it could be way more than that. But at minimum, three to four gallons of gas round trip. So right then there alone, like you literally look at that, and I'm going to do the math. Say it's four gallons of gas. That's 19.6 times four. That's 78.4 pounds of CO2. Um, which, if you look at two servings of meat per day at, say, 13 pounds, that's the equivalent of six days of eating two servings of meat a day. Round trip drive in a big car from Santa Monica to L.A. and back. So that gives you a little bit of perspective. What are some ways to reduce, other ways to reduce? Because I think it is important that we reduce our carbon footprint. No ifs, ands, or buts. I certainly think that that's something that we should be focusing on um, and try and do. If you use a low flow shower head, literally just change your shower head, you can save 350 pounds of carbon uh, CO2 per year. 350 pounds. That's literally the equivalent of 27 days of eating meat twice a day, two servings of meat per day. 27 days if you just switch your flower head. And that's from Texas A&M University, 10 simple ways to reduce your carbon footprint. Now let's use this example. In 2016, the average domestic commercial flight emitted 0.39 pounds of CO2 per passenger per mile. Now imagine a flight between Tampa and LA, one that I travel on a lot, 2,158 miles, that's 841 pounds of CO2 per passenger on that flight. That alone, that alone, that flight is the equivalent of about 70 days of eating meat two times per day for one flight. So I think you're starting to understand the context here. Like I think there, I think if carbon emissions is the big focus here, I won't even get into the details. And that's why I'm so curious about this. That's literally why I want to jump on. I told the team, I just want to make this video more so because I want to learn. And like, this was a cool exercise for me learning because I think carbon emissions is a big one, but in essence, like, I think it's a, I think it's important to not just jump to assumptions or listen to this person or listen to this person. I like doing it and finding resources and, and doing the research myself, but I think it's interesting. Other ways to do it. If you just, uh, if you did lower your beef consumption with chicken for a year, you can lower your footprint reduction by 882 pounds. Um, I consume a mix of beef and chicken, so uh, that's, that's not an issue. But even just making different choices, maybe you go to one serving of beef per day, or instead of three, maybe you go to two, you, you, can, you can make an impact for sure. But it still loses context of some of these other things I'm gonna talk about. Organic food, who doesn't eat organic food? So organic meat, requires 30 to 50% less energy during production. So energy being the, one of the number one uh, greenhouse gas, em or gas emissions, uh, carbon footprint wise of what's going on, uh, you can reduce that 30 to 50% by just going organic versus non-organic. Sure, it's more expensive because it requires more labor, but uh, you, can, you can consume less energy, which has a way higher impact than any of the other things that we've talked about, eating four ounces of beef per day. This was interesting, and I didn't even dive into it because I, uh, I think it's I think it's interesting. But Carnegie Mellon, I'm gonna I'll post this just from 2015, um, finds that eating lettuce is more than three times worse in greenhouse gas emissions than eating bacon. Um, so it's interesting, and the first line actually talks about uh, back then Arnold. Uh, actor Arnold Schwarzenegger 
at the United Nations Paris Climate Change Conference talking about how eating a vegetarian diet could contribute to climate change. Um, so it's interesting, right? It's interesting nonetheless um, that there actually may be some data showing that eating bacon is less bad for the environment than we once thought of. Uh, so let, last thing I want to touch on, last thing I want to touch on, because I'm, again, I'm making this video, I, I just want to bring perspective, because I think a lot of times people lose that, and I think especially with the name and the clout that's going to be around this, and it doesn't launch for a couple months, but I'm just fascinated, fascinated by the entire movement and area and the concept around it. But uh, my good friend uh, Rob Wolf posted this, and this is interesting. Like, if you look at the ingredients that's inside of one of the most popular vegan or vegetarian alternatives, which still blows my mind to this day of why it's a vegan or vegetarian alternative, um, which is the, I think they call it the Impossible Burger, um, or the Beyond Burger. And um, so he, so it's a burger, and now they're getting it to like try and bleed like, like try and get red in the center and try and bleed like an animal. And I'm like, it's interesting because it's kind of going against what I, nonetheless, it's, it's strange. But if you look at the ingredients in this, he posted it next to dog food and literally the ingredients are absurd. Like the amount of ingredients in this thing and the fact that they use things like canola oil, which we know the downsides of some of these vegetable oils, I didn't know what the ingredients were, and actually Keto Connect has a really good article uh, up on on like all of the different aspects about this. I'll post that article because I think they did a really good job on that. Um, but it's interesting. It's interesting to look at these ingredients. And so a lot of these things, and it, this kind of ties everything back into the, the carbon emissions, is like you can't make the argument that you're trying to reduce carbon emissions if you're eating something like this. And I know virtually every vegan or vegetarian I've, I've spoken to has probably at least tried one of these. And you don't realize like everything that goes into it. You just think, oh, I'm eating something that uh, is, is vegan or, or vegetarian based and it, it's fine, it's, I'm, I'm helping out the environment. But you're not, because here's, here's the context. Uh, I'll give you an example. Just one of these ingredients. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there are more of these ingredients that are brought in from out of the country. But I'm just going to use one because I'm 99.99% sure it's imported because uh, it's made over and the highest exporter of it is Myanmar. And that is the mung bean protein that they use in this. So they use a combination of rice protein, which can be done in the U.S. Pea protein can be done in the U.S., but a lot of these things likely are imported. Think about that for a moment. You can see where this is probably going. So I wanted to do this analogy for you. Myanmar, the largest exporter of mung bean, ultimately the ones that probably contribute to the mung bean protein that's in there, to California, where Impossible Foods is headquartered and where their manufacturer is. 7,767 miles, that flight. So if they loaded up an entire flight full of mung bean protein, because Impossible Burger's doing incredible, right? They're selling through the roof. They just raised a ton of money. They're in everywhere. You, I think I saw something like Little Caesars lost like a, a Beyond Pizza. Like the other day I was at, I think it was like Burger King and they had a Beyond Burger. It's insane. Like literally taking over and people are buying it like crazy. Uh, potentially because of this reason, because they think it's better. And they think one of the reasons they think it's better Maybe the, the, the animal thing, but they may be thinking the carbon emissions. On average, a plane produces a little over 53 pounds of carbon dioxide per model. I'm talking about the entire plane. Uh, 53 pounds of carbon uh, dioxide per mile. You ready for this? So on that flight, the 7,767 mile flight from Myanmar to California, 411,651 pounds of carbon dioxide on that flight is the equivalent, carbon, carbon footprint-wise, of 34,304 days of eating four ounces of meat two times per day. 
So don't lose context. I think it's important to understand like there's a lot of information that's out there. If you're an athlete, first and foremost, and this is the biggest part that I want to address at everything because I think other situations can be unique. Um, and I'll tag some people and, and cite them for more information because I think they bring a lot of value. But if you are an athlete and your goal is to optimize performance and optimize body composition, your chances of doing so on a plant-based approach are extremely difficult and a lot more challenging than someone who's eating meat. No doubt about it. And so I hope this video provides a little bit of context. And again, I don't know how many times I have to say it. This isn't an anti-vegan, uh, vegetarian talk. Uh, it's an educational rant of how we need to keep things in context and understand, you know what? Amino acids are important. Whole protein sources are important. Maybe the animal cruelty thing isn't as what it appears. You're killing a lot of animals if you're consuming grains as well. It's just understanding, like, if so, you value one animal's life greater than another, and that's fine. You just have to be able to fully admit that. Um, and the carbon emissions, there's way better options uh, for reducing carbon emissions, like maybe not flying as frequently, uh, maybe not driving as frequently, maybe switching to an electric uh, vehicle, but that has a whole nother animal within it, right? Like our, uh, the amount of, that's, of carbon that's emitted through charging elect electric cars, like I don't know the details on that, but maybe bike to work instead of driving your car or walk around or walk to the store, you'd get a lot more out of that than if your whole primary mechanism or reason for why you're not eating meat is carbon emissions and the carbon blueprint. Um, there's other ways to do it better. So I'll leave you guys with that. And again, I'm completely open and honest. Uh, would love to hear your guys' thoughts on any of those. The amino acid, there's three big points. Amino acids, there is uh, animal and killing of animals or sacrificing of animals, as I like to put it, and carbon emissions. If you have any thoughts on any of them, please let me know below. Would love to hear from you guys. And as always, appreciate you guys tuning in. Love you. Make positivity louder. I'll talk to you later.